deconstructing the past to help you make sense of today. Time for another award-winning episode of Pre-Nicene Perspective with your host, Darren Kalama. They say that there's nothing new under the sun, but never before has the enemy of all mankind, as described in 1 Thessalonians 2.15, had this much unfettered power. Power and control leveraged by a monopoly on finance, bioweapons, and technology that acts as a force multiplier, allowing the relatively small group of Satan's earthly parasites to dominate a major portion of the world. And it is no accident that you find them atop every major lever of power throughout societies. It's by careful design and planning over many years, a model of subversion and dominance perfected over millennia, similar to a virus. This earthly carnal power magnified to an unprecedented degree has been coupled with another power, a power you can't see but is vastly more destructive. It is the power to blind, delude, and confuse the mind. And it is a power that Satan uses quite skillfully as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1-2. through 2. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them." Unquote. Now, when the Apostle Paul says, the God of this world, who do you think he's talking about? Well, he's talking about the same God or deity worshipped by the enemy of all mankind, their father, Satan. And the father and his soulless hatchlings work together. They always have. It's been the same bad movie on loop for thousands of years. And combined, they work together to put Christian Western civilization into a fatal nosedive. Hijackers on the flight deck, and they only know how to push down on the yoke. They only know how to destroy, subvert, and pervert and they attack in a destructive wave that saturates and infects every public and private institution, especially schools. And now they're taking special aim at children with abortion-tainted RNA bioweapons, sodomite propaganda, mentally ill drag queens, and genital mutilation Frankenstein surgeries. These aren't schools anymore. They're Bolshevik horror houses intent on the physical and spiritual destruction of your children. Consider, they remove prayer from public schools, and now they want to replace it with armed guards. A place of learning becomes an incubator of fear, delusion, and misery. They create a problem and then offer you a solution to it in the form of more destruction. And as they smirk and dare you to do something about it, let us recall what fate Jesus said would come to those who defile and pervert children. From the Gospel of the Lord, chapter 13, verse 3, Then he said unto the disciples, It is inconceivable but that occasions of stumbling will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were a gain if he had not been born, or if a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea rather than that he should cause one of these little ones to stumble." Unquote. And I can tell you, nobody is going to shed a tear in this life or the next when they finally understand what Jesus meant by that quote. Now, nothing I've told you so far is controversial or even in debate. These are simply the facts as you can see with your own eyes. And documented around the world, cities that look like open zoos, corporations promoting sodomy, drag queens, and genital mutilation as they pretend to sell products, third world invasions masquerading as immigration. There's been a complete inversion of reality. What was once evil is now championed as good. And if you disagree, you're ostracized and demonized. Even the U.S. military is using the same degenerate model in recruitment ads. The spiritual attack is so vast and overwhelming that most people just shut down. They short-circuit. They pretend it's not happening, or they use various other coping mechanisms. What you are witnessing is end-stage parasitism. 
Satan's parasites have completely destroyed the defenses of the host, and the closest examples we can find in recent history would be a post-Versailles Treaty Weimar Germany in the late 1920s and the Bolshevik hijacking and takedown of Russia in the early 1900s. Now, if you think it's bad in America and Western Europe right now, have you got a surprise coming when you learn about Weimar Germany? It's actually a mere image of today, except, if you can fathom it, even worse. Drag queens, child prostitution, open hardcore drug use, bizarre sexual fetishes displayed and promoted on city streets. Berlin made Oakland, Detroit, and Baltimore look like a 1950s version of Disneyland and Norman Rockwell paintings in comparison. And just like today, Satan's parasites had hijacked all of the levers of power. Media, banking, medicine, government, even the arts. Now, the people were disgusted at how this small group of alien parasites had taken over their Christian country and had inverted good with evil, and just like now, it didn't happen overnight. It was a gradual process. Do it too fast, and people will react violently and expel the parasite from the country. So instead, it was done incrementally, starting with things like language, definitions, and the meanings of words. You see, doesn't that sound familiar? There's nothing new under the sun. The names change, but the parasite remains the same, and so does its playbook. The same playbook used in Germany was also used in Russia in the early 20th century. There, they call themselves Bolsheviks, and they murdered millions of Christian Russians in the streets, even tying priests to lampposts and disemboweling them. Now, it never got quite that bad in Germany because the people there elected someone to fix the problem before the situation devolved into a complete hellscape. But Russia wasn't that lucky, though, and it should come as no surprise that the same people who hated them then hate them now. Now, for context, you might find it interesting to know that Russia recently banned sodomite propaganda aimed at children and made it illegal for sodomites to quote-unquote adopt children. And they also cracked down on the shape-shifting NGOs that were financing the subversion. Now, I'd talk more about this, but they're kind of in the middle of a war right now. Now, if you've never heard of any of this before, maybe you should ask who's writing the textbooks in your kids' schools. And as long as you're cracking open some books, have a look at a parasite called the horsehair worm. It functions in a similar way to Satan's parasites, hijacking both the body and mind until the insect victim is ordered to commit suicide. Now, interestingly, as the dying insect spasms for the last time, the parasite explodes out of the abdomen of the host, refreshed and ready to spawn a new generation of parasites. It's quite charming. And it also should sound pretty familiar. Now, substitute the insect host for the name of a country, and you'll understand the mechanisms used by the enemy of all mankind in its drive to eliminate Christianity. Yes, eliminate. As in not just destroy a generation or two, but as in final solution. When you understand this is a no-holds-barred spiritual war, it makes you wonder what that fake plague and DNA-mutating vax was all about, doesn't it? And after this pleasant journey down memory lane, we find ourselves back to the topic of today's episode, which is what, if anything, you can do about it as a Christian. But before we answer that question, we need a little bit of background and context. In fact, we need to go back, way back, to the most persecuted Christians in the history of the world and see what they did. What strategies did they employ for defense while under attack from Satan's parasites and their proxies. Up until now, I think we can all agree that the most dangerous era for Christians was immediately following the murder of Jesus Christ by Satan's parasites and his subsequent resurrection. We refer to this as the pre-Nicene Christian era, roughly from 33 AD to the culmination of the Council of Nicaea disaster in 325 AD. Now, during those centuries, Christians, including the apostles, were hunted down and murdered, and 
relentlessly persecuted by Jews and Romans alike. They were set on fire while alive by Emperor Nero and fed to lions in the Colosseums. They had to perform mass in hiding underground in the catacombs and were issued today's version of Vax passports after being forced to worship pagan gods and signing a loyalty oath, or libellus, under Emperor Decius. I'd like to see some of today's strip mall Judeo-Christians and their evangelical carnival barkers survive even a day of what the pre-Nicene Christians endured for centuries. Now, you might be saying, whoa, Darren, that sounds a little unfair. I mean, things were a lot different back then. And you know what? You'd be right. Things were different back then. Very different. So different that those pre-Nicene Christians would think most of you today were in a weird cult or possessed. Let me explain. You see, they used the first Christian Bible, which was compiled in 144 AD. The one you use today wasn't even edited and stapled together by the Catholic Church until late in the 4th century, 382 AD to be precise. So what was in this first Bible, this pre-Nicene Bible? The only Bible, by the way, that Christians used during the darkest of times. The only Bible they had before being set to the torch and awaiting their fate in the Colosseum pits. The only Bible used in the catacombs as they feared for their lives simply for saying Mass and praying. Well, it was a lot different from the one you have today. For starters, it had just one gospel, the gospel of the Lord, the revelation received by the Apostle Paul directly from Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. Maybe you remember him telling you about it in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. Quote, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Unquote. Yes, that gospel. Let that sink in. There is only one. Don't believe me? Still wandering around in a Hebrew haze? Well, let's read what Paul said when he found out there were extra gospels, false Judaized gospels being circulated. And I quote, I marvel that ye are so quickly changed from him that called you into the grace unto a different gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ, unquote. And of course, we find that in Galatians chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. Oh, but there's even more differences between these Bibles. The first one also contained Paul's original ten epistles, but it's not what's in there that may surprise you. You see, up until 325 AD, Christians had their own God, their own religion, and their own Bible. It wasn't until that dark year at the Council of Nicaea that the Hebrew Torah and that extra alien religion was stapled onto your Bible. And after a name change, you know it today as the Old Testament. And by the way, if you'd like a free copy of that pre-Nicene Bible, original and unedited from 144 AD, you can download it at theveryfirstbible.org. In fact, it might be a good idea to pause the episode right now and do that, as it will help as we move along here. Now, as I share what for some of you is new information, I'd like you to reflect on the state of decay of all Western Christian churches today, not just the Catholic Church. I think you'll discover that Stapling that alien religion along with its Yahweh desert war god deity created a corrupt tree whose bad fruits are only now being truly realized and born in full. An alien deity that ordered the Jews to murder women and children on multiple occasions. Simply put, the pre-Nicene Christians believed God was only revealed to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Everything prior the Egyptians and Isis, the Greeks and Zeus, the Romans and Saul and Victus, the Jews and Yahweh, the Chinese and Buddha, the Hindus and Vishnu. Even in the most charitable of interpretations, you couldn't go much farther than to say they were trying to connect with, as the Apostle Paul puts it, the God of this world. But more on that later. And by the way, Nowhere in any Bible from any denomination on earth does Jesus tell you to pray to something called Yahweh. 
nor is the name Yahweh found in any New Testament ever printed in the last 2,000 years. It's a name found 6,823 times in the Torah Old Testament, but not once in the New Testament. And when you think about it, that's exactly what you'd expect when you staple two different religions together. Okay, I see you're back from downloading the first Christian Bible. That's good. Now that we're on the same page, as it were, let's read the two verses together that saved so many lives in that era and might save yours today. And we find them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. If anyone obey not our word by this epistle, take note of such and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. And yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And then, just so there's no confusion, Paul makes it crystal clear with, quote, Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother or sister who walks disorderly and not after the tradition which with they received us, unquote. Now, I have every confidence that our listeners that are lukewarm Judeo-Christians, the first thing that they're going to do is rifle through their Judeo-Christian Bible, hone in on the Old Testament Torah, and look for a loophole. And you know what? They're probably going to find one. Some Hebrew scribblings that contradict our Christian command and allow them to still mingle with sodomites and satan's parasites under a system governed by the enemy of all mankind some tortured nuanced verse and word game that in their deluded mind justifies them to just keep on doing what they've been doing but such a game of theological twister is not available to christians who believe on the first bible and that's because it doesn't have an extra religion stapled to the front of it. There's no cheap mulligans allowed, sorry. It means exactly what it says, and it doesn't need a room full of yeshiva students or Sanhedrin court scholars to explain what it means. Now, how do I know this? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 23. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. And it is precisely because of the clarity of instructions given to us in the first Bible that the pre-Nicene Christians avoided being snuffed out completely under a horrific scorched earth extermination campaign. Here, let's read it again. Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother or sister who walks disorderly and not after the tradition which they received us. It's crystal clear. But can we apply that command to our situation today? And the answer is 100% absolutely. Now remember, without repentance, there can be no forgiveness. And absent repentance, this is your next step in the spiritual escalation ladder. They are to be shunned. You are to cease contact and interaction with them. And not only is Paul instructs to bring shame upon them in hopes they repent, but also as a way to protect yourself from them and avoid being drawn into temptation or ensnared in webs of their creation. This is God's way of protecting both of you. Now, let's do a fast workflow chart on that. Number one, rebuke. You rebuke them for their sin, making them aware of the trespass. Number two, they repent. Number three, you forgive. And there's no limit to how many times this process can be repeated if the repentance is sincere. And how do we know this? Again, the command is clear from chapter 13, verse 3 of the Gospel of the Lord. But if your brother trespass against you, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against you seven times in the day, and seven times in the day turn again to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him, unquote. However, if there's a failure in that workflow and repentance is not forthcoming, you are to shun them. You are to withdraw from them. Now, here's where it gets interesting. This verse and workflow can also be applied to organizations, companies, groups, governments, and yes, even churches. Behind all of them, no matter how big or small, are people. And when people, whether hiding behind the facade of a company or government or not, act in a way in contrivance of our Christian beliefs 
or order you to do something in contrivance of your Christian beliefs, they are to be shunned. Remember, companies and politicians are not immune from shunning. And if Christians realized and exercised the power they actually have, we would be in an entirely different situation right now. Satan's parasites would have never gained control of the levers of power in the first place because politicians would have refused to work with them. They would have refused their lobbying efforts, blackmail, and bribes. Their fear of Christian voters shunning them would have outweighed any other considerations. So exactly how did Satan's parasites mitigate and neutralize this threat? Well, they targeted the churches with a deal with the devil called 501c3. And if your church wants to maintain its tax-free status, they better dummy up when it comes to politicians and legislation that's morally repugnant and antithetical to Christian beliefs. Instead of the church as being the cornerstone and voice of a country founded on Christian ideals, they're now the neutered, silent punchline of a sick joke. Worse, we find them working right alongside Satan's parasites, aiding in the subversion and destruction of the country. During the recent fake plague theater, they were the biggest promoters of injecting their own congregations with the abortion-tainted and deadly RNA bioweapons as they locked their own doors and genuflected to Satan. Make no mistake, these aren't churches. They're tax-exempt Judeo-Christian pizza huts in a suburban strip mall. It's truly disgusting. And instead of repenting, politicians try and outdo each other with displays of depravity and support of abortion, sodomy, child genital mutilation, and perversion, knowing full well that tax-exempt churches won't say a word to oppose them as Satan parasites give them bag after bag of 30 silver coins. Recall 1 Thessalonians 2.15 when Paul says the Judeans prevent us from preaching the gospel. And 501c3 is just another way that they do that. Truly, I tell you, it is an evil and corrupt system that is functioning exactly as designed. And it must be shunned lest you be dragged down with it. And on a quick side note, um, some churches like the Marcionite Christian Church they stood their ground and not only banned these satanic RNA bioweapon injections, they actually issued religious exemptions for free to anyone that asked. And it's also worth noting that their faith is founded on that first Christian Bible of 144 AD, the pre-Nicene Bible that we just talked about. You can learn more about them at marcionitechurch.org. So, simply put, Spiritual discernment based on clearly worded Christian commands isn't that difficult. You'll know which people, companies, groups, politicians, and governments to shun because they'll come right out and tell you. By their fruits, you shall know them. Anheuser-Busch, Target, Disney, U.S. Armed Forces, Starbucks, anything associated with BlackRock, CEI, ESG, Carbon Credits, SPLC, LGBTQ, CRT, ADL, Child Genital Mutilation, Climate Change, BLM, Antifa, CBDCs, they're not hiding it. They're proud of it. They don't care about the money. This is a spiritual war, and they demand that you bow down before Satan with them. All right, let's take a look at what you can do now, some proactive steps we can take immediately. It's advice amplified by the PCE, the Pre-Nicene Christian Ecclesia, which oversees outreach and development efforts for the Pre-Nicene Christian churches. You can learn more about them at prenicene.org. And by the way, there's a dash between pre and Nicene, so pre-nicene dot -E org. And here's the list. Number one, get out of the cities. Connect with other Christians and help each other form a common defense, a parallel Christian society. Next, get your children out of the public schools. Next, disconnect from government oversight and lists to the best of your ability. You know, one of the things we learned about the Jesus killers when they took full control in Russia as Bolsheviks in the early 1900s is that they love lists, so don't be on one. If there's something you can't do without doing KYC, it means you're probably not trying hard enough. Next, 
get your money out of the big banks and convert the majority of your fiat to Bitcoin, PMs, or alternative stores of wealth. Avoid KYC when converting from fiat. When the plug is pulled on the Fiat Ponzi, you'll be told everything is being moved to CBDCs, the new digital currencies, and you do not want to be in that position and left to their tender mercies for food and medicine. If you must maintain a Fiat account, open one up at a credit union. Dealing with other Christians when doing business is always preferable. Next, getting any injection or vax right now is a bad idea. Even seasonal flu vax is being produced as RNA vax. Is it really worth the risk? Let's let the wave crest and the water settle before involving yourself with elective medical procedures again. Okay, let's just hold off on that for a while. Next, make sure that you're on sound theological footing. Your Bible shouldn't have an extra religion stapled to the front of it. If it's not the original, unedited, first Christian Bible of 144 AD, it's just another book. Now, by the way, you can download that free at theveryfirstbible.org, and afterwards, it's a good idea to just copy that to a thumb drive, keep it safe. Now, remember, in the pre-Nicene era, churches weren't purpose-built and obvious. They were called meeting houses. And once per week, up to 10 people would gather for Mass and prayer at a private home. Sometimes Mass was held underground. We also know them as catacomb churches. Now, this was done to protect the faithful from both Roman and Jewish enemies hunting them down. And it's going to happen again. We got a taste of it during the fake plague when we saw police recording license plates in church parking lots and surveilling attendees for quote-unquote compliance reasons. And we know it's coming because, again, we have a specific command to handle it. Here in chapter 9, verse 1 from the Gospel of the Lord. And when they bring you up before the synagogues and unto the rulers and authorities, be not anxious how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say, for the Holy Spirit shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say, unquote. And I'll leave a link in the show notes, by the way, if you'd like to download that pre-Nicene Mass and Prayer liturgical guide. We all know what's going on here. We're in a spiritual war, and we're living under a hostile government. You need to be in tune with your environment. It's not your job to determine if someone is demonically possessed or simply mentally ill. Your job is to protect yourself and your loved ones. Use the common sense afforded to you by way of spiritual discernment. Even a casual conversation or question can tell us a lot. Something as simple as, do you disavow the hateful anti-Christian Talmud? Well, if you get a convoluted answer in response, walk away. Again, it's not an acid test, but it helps us navigate, like, uh, say, the way a hiker will use a walking stick. And let me be clear, what I've just told you should make you hopeful, not fearful. Many will have no idea what's real anymore as this great inversion of good and evil finally unfolds. But you cannot be deceived if you use the same gospel preached by Paul and adhered to by the pre-Nicene Christians. We've been through this before, and our pre-Nicene Christian ancestors have shown us it can be done. Jesus will crush Satan and his earthly parasites under his feet. And I don't know about you, but I definitely want to be there and watch it happen. That'll wrap it up for today, I think. And just a reminder, you can find all of FBN's content at firstbiblenetwork.com. And don't miss our daily news headlines in video format on Twitter at Biblia Primera, B-I-B-L-I-A-P-R-I-M-E-R-A. It's your shield against anti-Christian propaganda. I'm Darren Kalama with Pre-Nicene Perspective, praying that our Father's Holy Spirit finds and guides you during these difficult times. Kill them all, old and young, girls and women, and little children. Does that sound like something Jesus would ever say to you? The first Christians didn't think so either. And that's why you won't find the Old Testament in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. 
Reconnect with your pre-Nicene Christian roots and the Bible you were meant to have. 10 Books and the Gospel of the Lord. Download your free ebook at theveryfirstbible.org.